This is Duke University. We are getting ready to start our final panel of the day. And to moderate and to provide a brief introduction is Professor Stephen Schwartz. Uh, who is the Stanley A. Starr Professor of Law and Business here at Duke University Law School. Um, his areas of research and scholarship include insolvency and bankruptcy, international finance and capital markets, and commercial law. Uh, regarding this uh, recent financial crisis, Professor Schwartz has testified before the U.S. Uh, Congress and has advised several U.S. and foreign governmental institutions. So thank you very much, Professor Schwartz. Okay. Thank you very much. An honor and pleasure to be here and delighted to introduce this distinguished panel. Um, let me say who they are, and I'll give just a very short praise of their talks. They'll, they'll obviously say what they're, you know, what they're writing much better than I will. Uh, we have here Emily Johnson, who is an associate in the restructuring and finance group of the Wachtell Lipton Law Firm. Uh, she's the only member of this panel who went to a good law school. <laughs> uh, she was the articles editor of the Duke Law Journal, and her writings include the fiduciary duty in mutual fund excessive fee cases, which was published in the Duke Law Journal. Um, next to Emily, we have Professor Ernst Young, Ernest Young, um, who is the only professor I know who sounds like an accounting firm. <laughs> uh, he is the. <laughs> He's the Alston and Berg professor here. He teaches con law, federal courts, foreign relations law, and he's one of the nation's leading authorities on constitutional law of federalism. He joined our faculty in 2008 after serving as the Charles Allen Wright Chair in federal courts at the University of Texas, and he went to Harvard Law School, so there's my point. Um, he also clerked for De Justice David Souter of the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and then uh, on the far end there is Adam Feibelman. He is the Sumter Davis Marks Professor of Law at Tulane, and his JD is from Yale Law School. He then clerked for Judge Gilbert Merritt of the Sixth Circuit, and he served bef uh, as a Bigelow Fellow at the University of Chicago Law School, and that's where I first met him. Um, I had given one of these crazy law and economics workshops at Chicago, and Adam and I and others had had a nice dinner. So um, in any event, before Tulane, he was on the faculty at U University of North Carolina Law School, and I truly miss going into a coffee shop and seeing Adam there working on his computer because he's a wonderful colleague. Um, so what um, this distinguished panel will talk about is Emily Johnson and Professor Young will talk about the constitutional law of state debt. And they're really looking, trying to understand um, what the issues are from a constitutional law standpoint. They divide up debt into near-term and long-term fiscal problems. Uh, the near-term they call financial distress, the long-term is more economic, and they try to uh, determine what types of issues people need to grapple with in terms of trying to regulate this. Um, Adam, uh, Professor Feibelman, uh, has a very interesting um, thesis uh, that uh, states, American states, notwithstanding their quasi-sovereignty, should be allowed to be forced into an involuntary bankruptcy case. Now, many of you may know that in the corporate sector, a corporation or a business organization could file a voluntary bankruptcy, or under certain circumstances, they could be forced into involuntary bankruptcy. And that is what Professor Feilblumman is arguing, arguing, and that if the bankruptcy regime is very limited, that ought not to be constitutional. So I will allow these um, uh, panel members to uh, elucidate on this. Um, Emily Johnson first, 15 minutes each. Time starts now. <laughs> <laughs> so um, as, as Professor Schwartz mentioned, 
my student note was on mutual fund fees. So I have a history of taking arcane and boring topics, talking about them, analyzing them, and hoping you care. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to try to locate every, like this discussion of state debt. And we're talking about states are in distress, and we're talking about bankruptcy and IOUs and bailouts. And, and I know that the, the audience here, we have lots of varying interests in the law, and people may not be completely finance related. So what I want to do is just put some, some foundation under the talk we had this morning and Professor Orth's uh, lunchtime lecture and just sort of talk about what, what are the, the building blocks to understand the house is built on. So um, this morning people wanted to talk to you in stories. I'm going to talk to you in flow charts and <laughs> equations. So maybe it looks a little bit more like law school. So for those of you who are done with that, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm still pretty close to it. And, and I think this is sort of an easy way to, to structure it. So this morning when Professor Johnson opened, he said that the idea of state debt has broadened lately. It used to be when you thought about state debt, you thought about the general obligation bonds. Those are the bonds that have the full faith and credit of the state, and that was it. And now, he mentioned it this morning, and it's right, there's, there's, like a, there's a bigger group of obligations <coughs> that we're thinking of state debt. So basically there are four. You've got bond debt, which could be general obligation bond debt or revenue bond debt. And the difference between those two is revenue bond debt is often like project finance. So it's the bonds are issued and secured, which Steve Schwartz could tell us a lot more about, but they're issued and secured on certain assets. So he mentioned a parking garage. Maybe that it's a highway or a stadium. And so the bond debt only gets paid through the revenues that those assets generate. But general obligation bonds are different. Those are the bonds that they can tax me and you to pay. So we are the security for those, for those bonds. So that's the first piece of debt. And then the, the broader definition also includes unfunded pensions, other post-employee benefits, and that's usually health care costs. So most retirees, state retirees, they're they're promised health care benefits after retirement, but that's not the same as their pension benefit. And, and it's easier for states to renege on the health care promise than it is for the pension promise because pensions are vested in a different way than health care is. I cannot give you the details of the differences. I think my grievy can. Um, <laughs> well, I saw you shaking your head in knowledge, so I wanted to tip my hat there. And then the last thing is if there's an operating deficit. And it's been mentioned that all, all states except for one have a balanced budget um, provision in their constitution. And so, in theory, states have to balance their budgets every year. However, states have come up with great ways to actually move debt off their balance sheets in the same way corporations have moved debt off their balance sheets. And so there's a lot of state debt that's not on balance sheet debt. And so if you move that all to the balance sheet, state, states actually wouldn't be in, uh, it wouldn't be constitutional to issue all this debt because they move it off balance sheet, it works. Also, Professor Schwartz has written a helpful piece on this. Okay, so that's sort of the debt, like what we're thinking of as state debt. And then when we think about states in distress because of this debt, there, there's sort of two different types of distress. There's short-term, immediate, we can't pay our bills distress. And there's, we have a big problem coming. I can see it on the horizon. Baby boomers are retiring and not dying. And <laughs> we've got Medicare, Medicaid, every other thing in the world. We have very, you know, we've got high unemployment, depressed wages, deflation instead of inflation. This is, this is the other problem. So we're thinking about those two types of distress and just calling financial distress and economic distress. So financial distress 
is the first one that I talked about. It's more short term. It's, it's almost liquidity crisis-esque. Um, and then economic distress is the more structural distress. In the corporate sector, um, the bankruptcy code differentiates between these two types of distress. And chapter 11, which is what a company reorganizes under, is more appropriate for an entity that's in financial distress. And chapter seven, which is the liquidation chapter, is more appropriate for companies in economic distress. So, what kind of distress are the states in? Now, this may, in some ways people say, well, that's it's an academic question. It's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Because if your options are restructuring or liquidation, you can't liquidate a state. So it doesn't matter what kind of distress they're in. You know, quit talking about this. Not important. And it's true, Ernie, right? You can't liquidate a state? Can't liquidate a state. <laughs> Apparently, the Constitution's not cool with that. There's a... Uh, We've got a nice half-page footnote in the article about why you cannot liquidate a state. <laughs> I suggest looking at it. Um, and that's not to say you can't liquidate state assets, right? Because you can, you can privatize state assets. And in fact, you know, Greece has, Greece has done that. Other Latin American countries have done that to try to deal with uh, debt issues. You know, maybe North Carolina can sell the Ashboro Zoo. <laughs> I don't know that selling the giraffes is, first of all, I don't even know if actually they're owned by the state, but I think they are. <laughs> um, but you know, it, it's unclear that even if the state started to sell off those kind of assets, if it could come close to you know, paying its Medicare obligations. So liquidating the states is, is not very helpful. But understanding if we're dealing with financial distress or economic distress can help us know what, what kind of solutions <clears throat> will be useful or if the solutions are just going to be things you're throwing at the wall that aren't going to stick and are going to fail. So in our paper, Professor Young and I, we talk about four scenarios that states might try to engage in um, when they come to distress. Their payment delays, IOUs, bailout, and default. And I've sort of put them in the order that I think it's most likely. Um, I think after the morning panel, there would be some discussion about should three and four be switched. Um, but I, I think this is the way that it would happen. So what I'm going to do is talk about what each one would look like and talk about which financial distress could solve, which of these scenarios could solve financial distress and which of these scenarios could solve economic distress. And right now, most states are not in financial distress. This, we do not have, for the most part, a current fiscal state emergency where tomorrow North Carolina is not going to be able to pay your grandmother's pension. That's not what we're dealing with. A few states have a current financial emergency. California, Illinois, maybe Connecticut. Okay? So we've, we've heard a lot of, Peter talked about some of the things that are going on in California. The Wall Street Journal called California the Lindsay Lohan of states. It's just a total mess. <laughs> um, and, and Illinois is, Illinois is also quite the animal. Um, Illinois actually has a lot of political uh, disharmony between their treasurer and their governor. And Illinois' treasurer is on the record as saying he would call up banks and tell them not to buy Illinois debt because it's not a good investment. Uh, needless to say, the governor who wants to issue more debt because they cannot pay their bills is not very happy that his treasurer is saying to the banks and, in fact, the entire world that they're not a good investment. So. That is, okay. so the, those are the states, California, Illinois, Connecticut, maybe a few more, maybe you move Connecticut out, that, that have sort of current issues. And they've actually, California and Illinois have started already down this path of dealing with their fiscal distress. And the first way they started were payment delays. And so that's just what it sounds like. The state owes a contractor money, or you're a taxpayer, they owe your refund. 
and it was supposed to come January 1st, but they're going to delay the payment 30 days. It's going to come January 30th, 31st. Okay. This, like, we all hear it. We're sort of used to it. This happens in the corporate sector. It's sort of the first step. It's like putting your toe in, we are going to have problems and we're going to start solving them. Okay? So in 2009 in California, California delayed payment on $4 billion worth of debt. And they, they did it, it was a 30-day delay. And they did it because the legislature hadn't passed a budget. And because they hadn't passed a budget, they had no idea how much cash they would have. And California, um, California has certain constituencies that have to be paid pursuant to their um, court decisions, statutory law, and constitution. And those include bondholders, they include school kids, right? So in order to keep <coughs> paying bondholders and school kids, California didn't know if they were going to have enough cash to pay these people if they paid taxpayers their refunds and business, um, businesses that they contract with their contract payments on time because they didn't have a budget. But they can't not pay the bondholders and the school kids. So what they had to do was delay payment for these other businesses, taxpayers, and sort of move those payments so either they would have a budget and they would know or they were going to have to put them behind the others. Okay? So they did that. People are unhappy because they're not getting paid on time, but they get paid 30 days later. Okay. Ernie, when I get done, is going to talk about what are the constitutional issues and problems that this arises. So I'm just walking you through what are, what are the scenarios. Oh, Emily, one, mm -hmm. one minute. Oh, one minute. One minute. Or you can take two minutes. I'm going to take two and a half. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, <laughs> so the, the next are IOUs. And IOUs, are the, they're the next step. We've heard of them. They happen in California. And what an IOU is, it's like a check that can't, it's like a post, a post check. Can't be cash for three months. So I'm going to pay, you worked for me. I'm going to pay you. I'm going to give you a check. Because I pay you every two weeks in a check, right? You take that check to the bank, done. But this time I'm going to pay you in a check, and you can't cash that check for three months. <sighs> okay. So that's, that's not great, but it's a security. The, the SEC said this is a security. And for the first few days, banks were taking them just like they were, like they were money good. But eight days after California started issuing them, banks, big banks stopped taking them. This was 2009. The banks, banks were having a rough time then. Not that they're hunky-dory now, but they were really bad then. And, but smaller community banks kept taking them. But the point is, it wasn't, you weren't getting paid in cash. You are getting paid in something other than what you contracted for. Originally, you didn't get paid in cash. You got paid in check, but it could immediately be turned into cash. This couldn't. The next is a bailout. And so when, when you have financial distress, it's because your assets and liabilities, you, have, you either have to reduce your liabilities or increase your assets, right? And so a bailout is basically increasing assets. So you come in and somebody here, probably the federal government, gives you money. The real constitutional questions, questions we started talking about already is we talked about it with Peter's proposal. Um, I think Mike touched on it, is what kind of conditions are the federal, federal government going to put on that money? They're probably not just going to come in and say, here, California, here's, you know, however many billion dollars. Do whatever you want, and we don't want anything in return. Because it's going to be very difficult to convince people in North Carolina who are actually paying that bailout with their tax money. And we have a AAA rating and aren't in as bad a shape as they are, so why should we bail them out? Sort of the same moral hazard problem that you saw with homeowners who didn't take a jumbo mortgage who didn't see why they had to bail out people who did. And then finally, there's state default. And I think this is the most interesting. <laughs> but now I have 30 seconds to talk about it. <laughs> so this is a state that says, nope, we're not paying you. We're not paying you, bondholder. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> and this is exactly what Professor Orth talked about at lunch. It's very difficult to think, as a bondholder, you're holding this piece of paper, and you knock on California's door, and you say, this paper says you owe me money, and they say, we're not paying you. So you've got two challenges. The first is to get a judgment to say they do pay you, right? So you have to go to court, and you have to fight with all of those sovereign immunity issues. Who can go to court? Who can't? And then, even if you, let's say you did get a judgment. 
let's say they waive immunity, for example. North Carolina waives immunity. They waive immunity. You go to court and you have a piece of paper that says California owes you however many dollars. How do you collect? In North Carolina, you'd have to get an appropriation from the state legislature. Is that likely? <coughs> if they could have paid you, would they have paid you already? And, and so you have to get the appropriation, or can you attach assets? Could you, like, let's say North Carolina moves some of its money out to New York, it runs through New York and then comes back to North Carolina. Could you stop it when it's in New York and try to attach those assets when it's outside of North Carolina? It's unclear. So there, there are a lot of issues around default uh, that are fun to think through, because if it gets to the point where states are going to default, the people who own the debt now, which are not the banks, we don't have the same problem Europe does, but it's, uh, it's pensioners, it's you know, foundations, they own state debt because it's tax favorable. So they're gonna sell it off when it looks like things are getting bad. They'll take, they'll take a loss, they're gonna sell it to hedge funds. So you have distressed investors, highly litigious, and we might get some interesting uh, 10th and 11th Amendment law. Okay, thank you. So Adam, you're, you're next. Uh, were you gonna stay here when I'm, I'm going to stay. Here. All right. I'm late. Okay, then I'm, I'll start off the trend. <laughs> um, so, um, first of all, I want to thank the conveners uh, of the conference and symposium for inviting me and including me in it. Uh, it's great to be back in the uh, Triangle area and among friends uh, and, and former colleagues who are also friends. Um, uh, and, and it's very exciting to join in this discussion which uh, touches on some really important topics. Uh, so as, as uh, Steve suggested, my, my paper uh, for the conference responds to what's been kind of a spurt of writing uh, on whether states should be able to file for bankruptcy in the first place or uh, obtain relief under federal bankruptcy law, and, and, and quickly my proposal, uh, and my paper's kind of in that genre of proposals like, like Peter's, uh, is that any bankruptcy regime uh, uh, for states should provide uh, for an involuntary mechanism for states under narrow circumstances, uh, and furthermore, uh, that such a provision would be constitutional. Um, and my primary motivation for the piece um, uh, was to pick a topic that exasperated Melissa Jacoby, um, <laughs> who some of you know, uh, and uh, who is a former colleague and dear mentor uh, of mine. Um, and I strongly believe that the best way to honor a mentor is to cause them intellectual distress. Uh, so that's what I, I think I've done, actually, for what it's worth. Um, but joking aside, uh, I've uh, written what I think are some wacky papers uh, in my short career. But none have elicited the kind of responses that, that this draft uh, has. Um, uh, you, usually people kind of humor me in my ideas. Um, uh, but, uh, but here, pe people, when I describe what I'm working on and the, the basic thesis, uh, kind of stop, stop me mid-sentence and explain that that is demonstrably wrong. Uh, and they seem to be rather upset uh, by the, by the um, suggestion. So, Perversely, the more objection I've run up against, the more um, I've been persuaded that, uh, in fact, if we extend bankruptcy for states to states, uh, it should include an involuntary component, uh, and that the constitutional questions uh, that that would raise are actually harder, more interesting than everyone assumes. Um, and uh, in any event, given the uh, the kind of strong reactions uh, and uh, and strong skepticism, I feel that. My burden is actually a little different than normally in that I don't have to persuade people that I'm right, just that the ideas and proposal, uh, proposals are not patently absurd. Um, uh, and, and actually, <laughs> slightly more seriously, but only slightly more seriously, um, I do kind of have a subtextual goal uh, with the paper, um, which is uh, to kind of extend uh, and this is, I, I do it in a kind of backhand way, but to kind of extend some criticism that I have for the, the whole idea of extending bankruptcy to states to begin with and to try to further problematize uh, uh, those, those sets of, uh, of proposals. Um, so in the time uh, that I, I have remaining, I, I just want to kind of walk through uh, the, the argument. Um, the first step, uh, again, builds on <coughs> proposals for extending uh, relief in, in bankruptcy to, to American states. 
Uh, and the, there are a number of, of arguments for this, but the main ones, I think, and the most compelling arguments are that uh, a, a bankruptcy regime can help reduce the chances or the scope of a federal bailout um, if a state experiences a financial crisis, um, if it experiences financial distress in the, in the acute way that uh, Emily was, uh, was describing. Um, and elsewhere, in, in other work, um, I've argued that actually bankruptcy isn't necessary for states to ob obtain relief if they really um, uh, uh, are in an acute financial crisis, then uh, as sovereigns do uh, with some frequen frequency, they can obtain debt relief in an ad hoc, informal uh, uh, manner. Um, uh, and that, that there may be some savings for uh, uh, that, that can be wrung out of that process by formalizing it in, under kind of federal bankruptcy law. Uh, but in any event, that's, those savings aren't as large as people think, uh, and it's unlikely to happen. Um, but uh, so the, the further point here is if the goal of extending bankruptcy to states is to um, reduce costs and losses associated with financial uh, distress, um, or in, in other words, reduce the amount or the likelihood of the need for a federal bailout, the real problem isn't uh, the mechanism for providing the relief, whether it's formal in bankruptcy or, or informal uh, through an ad hoc uh, restructuring uh, in, a, in a negotiated context, the real problem is that states are not likely to trigger either in a timely fashion. Um, and, uh, and, and if they don't, then the longer that, that a state delays in triggering whatever relief may ultimately be coming, uh, then uh, the hole gets deeper. And it can get quite deep rather quickly in that kind of, in those final periods where uh, financial distress uh, has, has kind of uh, set in. So maybe extending a voluntary bankruptcy regime to states um, uh, would encourage them uh, to, uh, to uh, seek relief earlier because they know there's this formal process that that they can trigger and, uh, and would be uh, predictable. Um, but actually, I think that, that all the available evidence uh, from lots of different contexts suggests otherwise. That in fact, debtors that are able to either file for bankruptcy in, in other contexts or sovereigns that are able to obtain uh, ad hoc debt relief, in fact, uh, consistently delay longer than, than we think they should or past the point where debt relief would have been beneficial. Um, and so that's why, as, uh, as, as Steve mentioned, uh, many or most bankruptcy regimes uh, have included some type of involuntary bankruptcy component, where uh, generally creditors can, uh, can force a debtor into, uh, in, into uh, bankruptcy. And historically, under English law, all bankruptcies were involuntary. Uh, and it, again, it's a very common feature uh, around the world. Um, currently, in the U.S., it's a rarity, uh, certainly in relation to the, the kind of total uh, caseload of, of bankruptcy cases. But it is available in business bankruptcy cases and consumer cases under Chapter 7. Uh, not, interestingly, consumer cases under Chapter 13, um, which I'm happy to say a little bit more about if people have questions. Um, so uh, it, the, the idea is that you give this tool to creditors uh, to either actually pull the trigger earlier if they meet the standards and force a, 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 a debtor into bankruptcy, um, or the fact that they might do it um, forces the debtor's hand uh, to do so voluntarily uh, sooner than it otherwise would. Um, and I also, I, I think it's important uh, to acknowledge that uh, it's certainly possible, and, and actually frequently the case, that creditors um, can informally force their debtors into bankruptcy. In fact, this happens uh, uh, routinely, where a creditor can threaten to take a certain action uh, upon a default or mispayment, um, uh, and, uh, and the debtor will respond either by filing for bankruptcy or, or some other um, ameliorative uh, 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 course of action. So that's just a little bit about kind of involuntary bankruptcy in general and the role that it plays. And so uh, the proposal 
um, uh, that, that I've set forth in the paper is, is slightly modified from the way uh, involuntary bankruptcy would play out in the, uh, in, in the corporate or consumer context. And, and so I propose that the, the federal government should be given the, the power to trigger uh, a bankruptcy, uh, a state bankruptcy, rather than creditors. Um, uh, so it would be a, the federal government would trigger a state's bankruptcy um, if a bailout, and so here's kind of the standard, if a bailout seems likely, um, or the need for a bailout <coughs> seems imminent, um, or if uh, 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 the state's financial condition threatens uh, uh, national financial stability, or the national economic stability. Um, an e automatic stay would fall into place. For those of you who study bankruptcy, this is a very familiar feature. Um, collection actions against the state would, would be stayed automatically. Um, I, I propose that then a state could, after some short period of time, uh, decide to exit. Um, it would have a, a, a kind of an option to exit if it didn't want to be in, in bankruptcy. Um, uh, and that the um, kind of following actually uh, your, uh, uh, Steve's suggestion for a minimal bankruptcy uh, scheme for states, uh, that there would be something very skeletal and, and minimal available to states that it, a state would then have the opportunity to propose a plan, not the obligation to do so, and that the plan could then impair some claims against the state and perhaps provide for uh, uh, cramming down the plan on holdout uh, creditors, uh, those who, who wouldn't uh, agree to the plan otherwise, under certain circumstances, roughly s similar to what would happen um, uh, in, uh, in Chapter 11. Um, I think that the federal government is, is a much, really the only plausible trigger for a state, um, and it, it actually makes much more sense to give the trigger to the federal government, given that they're more likely than creditors to internalize both the benefits and the costs of pulling the trigger. Um, the benefits in, uh, in being exposed to a smaller potential bailout uh, and the costs, especially political costs, of, uh, of, of pulling the trigger um, and uh, angering people, especially in the state. Um, and for what it's worth, I think there would be a tricky, if anyone <laughs> likes the idea, there's a tricky question of who in the federal government should pull the trigger. Um, and uh, on that score, I, I, I think um, a likely an interesting candidate would be the newly created uh, Financial Stability Oversight Council that uh, was created under Dodd-Frank, comprised of the heads of the major uh, banking regulators that are now charged with um, uh, uh, kind of monitoring systemic, financial systemic stability. Um, but uh, but that's, uh, that's just an idea stacked on top of another idea. Um, and uh, so the, I, let me just make a, a, a quick point, and I don't think the proposal hinges on this, but I am making an assumption that may seem counterintuitive um, uh, on first blush, which is a state that was kind of forced into bankruptcy, one would think if it were given the option to exit, would then just exit. Um, but I'm not convinced that that's the case, right? If you assume that the problem is a threshold one and the state doesn't want to pull the trigger and voluntarily enter bankruptcy, but actually would like to be in bankruptcy because it affords um, uh, uh, some, some real benefits for obtaining uh, debt relief, uh, then it, it might actually, even though it grumbled and complained about being forced into bankruptcy, might then actually make use uh, of, the, uh, of the opportunities that it, that it afforded. Um, and again, I, I, I should uh, also acknowledge, maybe not again, but I should acknowledge that there's a real danger um, that the federal government itself would delay. Uh, and we've seen this actually in, in, in Europe, um, where uh, uh, actors at the union level have, have, also, have kind of participated in the uh, delay of, uh, of Greece obtaining um, uh, uh, relief. Um, okay. Um, and so uh, the, um, but, but so putting these two things together, I, I'm not suggesting that states, uh, that this will always ensure that states 
enter into bankruptcy uh, uh, earlier than they might, or that it would consistently operate in that fashion. I'm just suggesting that it might under some circumstances, uh, and that that's the, uh, the only real uh, uh, potential advantage of creating uh, a system whereby states could obtain uh, a bankruptcy relief to begin with. And let me just, and at, at the risk of going uh, over time, um, let me just very quickly tee up the constitutional question that I've uh, been uh, filibustering uh, to avoid, perhaps, uh, not intentionally. Um, uh, but uh, so as far as I see it, the real challenge here is a Tenth Amendment challenge, just to kind of cut to the chase, although I may be told otherwise. And uh, the, the constitutional questions um, are, this is, uh, I'm on unfamiliar territory. So, um, uh, and I still have some, that's the part of the paper that I uh, have some work to do on. Um, but I am operating kind of on what I perceive to be the general principle, right, that we have a system in which states retain some meaningful sovereignty. But it's not total, right? It's quasi-sovereignty. And we don't know exactly what that means, but we're balancing federal interests against state interests across a lot of different contexts. Um, Great. Okay. Well, we're going to now learn right. what it means. <laughs> <laughs> Ernie. Okay, well, I'm very grateful to Kara Duffel and the Con Law Journal for organizing this. I think they've done a beautiful job. Um, I want to especially thank John Orth for coming and for teaching me this material 16 years ago through his book. Um, and I really want to thank Emily, who, who is just a, an uncommon student. Um, there are a fair number of really good students at this law school who really immerse themselves in very sophisticated finance and, and that sort of thing. And there's a, a slightly smaller but very dear um, class of people who are willing to put up with listening to me about the 11th Amendment. But, but Emily is just about the only person I know um, who lives in both those worlds. Um, and I, I'm just very grateful for her to, for living there and, and for <laughs> making this paper possible because I just don't know enough to write this paper on my own. Um, there's an irony to the separation of these two subjects because debt is a terribly important force in our constitutional history. We, we tend to think of constitutional law as about things like flag burning or abortion or school desegregation, but for much of our history, con law has been essentially concerned with debt. Um, it was the impetus for the Constitution itself, which was proposed to solve some very, very sticky problems of public finance. When Madison talked about the tyranny of the majority, he was not talking about white people oppressing black people. He was talking about <clears throat> debtors who were in the majority oppressing their creditors. Um, and the original Constitution contained hardly any individual rights provisions at all. The one that had to be there um, to satisfy the framework was the Contracts Clause, which was aimed at protecting creditors from debtors. So, um, in talking about the con law under contemporary doctrine that applies, um, there's really two sets of questions. One are, what are the constraints on remedies available for creditors of the states, basically in a world where there's not much reform? Um, and then second, to what extent do other aspects of the Constitution constrain our ability to reform um, the way all this works? And the remedies questions come up most in considering, you know, what do you do if you're a creditor and, and you want to sue the state? Um, which hasn't paid on your bond or hasn't paid your pension or, or something like that, and in the various scenarios that, that Emily already talked about. Well, you can sue on the bond um, or on your employment contract. Um, if you're trying to do that in state court, the 11th Amendment, which overturned Chisholm, is, is going to bar that for all the reasons um, that, that Professor Orth explained, unless it's waived, unless the immunity is waived. And the interesting twist on that is that although the states do often waive their immunity, so for instance, North Carolina's general obligations bonds do waive sovereign immunity, that waiver is construed as only being a waiver for state court suits. It does not allow you to get into federal court. Now, a lot of people have kind of given up on the idea of suing in state court. I, I'm not sure. I mean, we may be giving up on that too quickly, but even if you can get a judgment in state court, you're going to have the problem of actually recovering the money because you may have, an you have to get an appropriation from the state, which you probably can't get. So that's not very satisfying. What if you sue for an impairment of the bond contract or your pension contract or employment contract <coughs> under the contracts clause? Um, well, Hans versus Louisiana bars that for, again, the reasons that Professor Orth explained at lunch. And it, it's worth emphasizing that Hans is not the same thing as the 11th Amendment. Right? Hans was very self-conscious about that. He said, if, if, if we were just going to talk about the text, 
of the 11th Amendment, maybe, maybe Mr. Hans could sue, but as the court later on said, the text has to be interpreted in light of postulates that limit and control. Right? And if any of you have taken constitutional law, you know exactly what sort of language that is. The Hans versus Louisiana is the Griswold versus Connecticut of 11th Amendment law. It's a penumbra idea. We used to, when we were working on the Seminole Tribe case, when I was clerking at the court, we used to go knock on the door of the Scalia chambers and, and, and say, we want to see the postulates that limit and control the 11th Amendment. We know you've got them in there someplace. <laughs> Let them out. We want to see them. Um, they didn't think that was very funny. <laughs> um, uh, Professor Sachs thinks Hans was right. Um, it's, it's unfortunate that we aren't going to be able to give him tenure here. Um, I, I think that um, you know, Hans was probably a mistake, but it stood for 100 years. It's unlikely to be going anywhere. Now, there may be one way around, which is you may be able to use the ex parte Young Doctrine to get, to get prospective relief against state officers, an injunction of some kind. So perhaps, for instance, you could enjoin the attempt to pay you in an IOU that, w that had changed the obligation of the original contract that you had with the state, that, that would be an injunction that would bar going forward. It's, uh, it's unlikely that you could turn that into um, an actual suit for payment on the debt. Now, I, I, I do this with trepidation, but I may disagree with Professor Orth a, a little bit and with much of the conventional wisdom in that I think actually this structure of sovereign immunity law makes a certain amount of rough practical sense. Um, and the reason is we, we have basically two sorts of cases, federal cases in which we're worried about sovereign immunity. And one are kind of the classic cases of state financial debts. Can you make the states pay up on their contracts? Um, and we've retained sovereign immunity in those cases because those cases posed an existential threat to the states, right? That's why we got the 11th Amendment so quickly. That's why we got Hans versus Louisiana. Those cases actually threatened to undermine the ability of the states to go forward as, as going concerns financially. And so even though sovereign immunity in some ways is a technical, monarchical doctrine that you'd think after we fought a revolution against those British people we wouldn't have around anymore, it also embodies the idea that basic existential questions about the, about the public fisc need to be made by legislatures and, and not just by courts. And so I think that's why we continue to care about sovereign immunity. Now, why do we allow prospective suits against officers? I think the reason is we're worried about a different class of rights claims. We're worried about school desegregation. We're worried about flag burning and abortion. We want the, the courts to be able to require the states to come into compliance with the Constitution going forward. Not necessarily to award big damages awards, but to force compliance in the future. Desegregate your schools. Don't prosecute people for burning the flag. Right? And so I think that's, that's kind of the basic rough reason behind the state of sovereign immunity law that we have. Now, another qu remedial question is whether Congress could alter this landscape, and I think it could in a couple of ways. One is it can induce the states to waive their sovereign immunity, um, and it could do this by conditioning various forms of federal benefits, federal, federal money, uh, maybe as part of a bailout scheme. That would be analyzed under the Dole test. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. The other way is that sometimes Congress can abrogate the state's sovereign immunity when it is acting pursuant to its powers to enforce the Reconstruction Amendment. So the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. And they can, that only works if the state's assertion of sovereign immunity, failure to pay, what, what, they're, being, what they're doing um, is unconstitutional. So you have to find an underlying constitutional violation. You might say, well, there's an underlying constitutional violation of the Contracts Clause which is probably true when the states doesn't pay. Unfortunately, the Contracts Clause isn't in the 14th Amendment. You might say, though, that when they fail to pay, that that's a violation of the Takings Clause or the Due Process Clause, or taking your property interest in the contract without due process of law. I don't know if that's actually going to work since you know, the very nature of sovereign debt is not that it cannot be enforced in the ordinary way, and so you might say that, people, that that was part of the initial package of property rights that people got when they entered into the debt. So that, those are the issues you'd have to think about there. Uh, and instead of collecting on the debts, what about, uh, what about altering the terms, right? So what about altering the state's obligations on pensions and things? And I think this is particularly likely to come up in the context of a bailout. And imagine if 
If Congress is the International Monetary Fund and California is Brazil or Mexico, what sort of things would Congress want or the IMF want as conditions on a bailout? Because you want to condition the bailout on structural guarantees that will make the whole thing less likely to happen again in the future. And I think some of the things that you would want, really two kinds of things you'd want. I think you'd want to try to get the state out of its obligations that are causing economic distress, so pension obligations, health care obligations, things like that. So you need to alter the underlying terms of contracts. You might also want to alter the way the state does business in terms of raising revenue. And so those California constitutional provisions that make it so hard to raise taxes, for instance. The first sets of alterations are going to be judged under the contracts clause. Ordinarily, you, it's, it's hard to go back and retroactively alter the state's own contracts. That's why it's nice to have the federal government come in and do it, because the contracts clause doesn't apply to the federal government. Now, it's not quite as simple as that, because there's, there's some cases that suggest that the contracts clause is kind of reverse incorporated against the federal government. And, and I think that's probably right. But not critical here, because the real difference is the contracts clause really <laughs> doesn't constrain the government much when it tries to alter contracts among other people, third parties, not the government itself. We, we retain a strong contract clause today really only with respect to the government's own contracts. We're worried about self-dealing. And so the state can't alter those obligations, but maybe the feds can, not because the contracts clause doesn't apply, but because they're not parties to those contracts. All right, So that, that may be how that plays out. The takings clause and the due process clause may still be a problem because there is some suggestion, even though we don't have a whole lot of, of economic liberty after the New Deal revolution, the, the Supreme Court even quite recently has said there is still a serious takings and due process limitation on retroactively altering things like pension obligations. That's the Eastern Enterprises versus Apfel case. It's hard to know exactly how that would play out here. Um, what if they do things like ask California to get rid of its constitutional constraint on raising taxes? Well, that would be analyzed under the spending clause. There are five components to that. It has to be for the general welfare. It clearly is. It has to be a clear statement. You could do that. It has to be germane to the purpose of the underlying bailout funds. It would be. The only two problematic things are that you can't ask the state to do anything that it would be unconstitutional for the state to do. Right? And so if you're asking them to alter their contracts, that's a problem. Um, but federal law perhaps could simply preempt those contracts, and then that would be better. Um, and then there's the coercion requirement. And I think the coercion thing is, is a serious problem. And I don't think it's a complete answer to say, as, as was said in the last panel, that, that the state has no right to the federal bailout money. That's to deny the very existence of an unconstitutional conditions doctrine. But, but we do have such a doctrine. It's not very strong. But I think the case like this would test the outer limits of it. Let me just speak briefly about the bankruptcy proposal. Uh, because it's no fun at all um, at a discussion like this until something gets declared unconstitutional. And so I'm grateful to Adam because the problem with our paper up to now was there was nothing that we had to shoot at that we were pretty sure was unconstitutional. But, but now that's been fixed. You will. Um, it's not patently absurd, but it did make me break out in the highs. <laughs> um, so what's the constitutional problem with the bankruptcy idea? forcing states involuntarily into, into bankruptcy. And I think there's a variety of theories that you'd have to think about. One is, is there's, there's some life still in the principle that there are just some aspects of state sovereignty that the federal government cannot intrude on. There's an old case called Coyle versus Smith that says you can't tell a state where to put its capital. Um, and maybe the, the actual operations of state government, you know, having a, a federal court direct the operations of state government under a bankruptcy <laughs> plan, that's, you know, I don't think the Coyle versus Smith territory is very large, but that might be in it. Second problem might be anti-commandeering. Right? You have a doctrine that you cannot require the states to implement federal law involuntarily. Um, now, I'm not sure that applies because the dividing line is you can't require the states to regulate other people pursuant to federal policy, but you can regulate them directly, right? And so maybe this is direct regulation. It depends on what the bankruptcy court is asking the state to do. If it starts asking them to run their operations in particular ways, that would be a constitutional problem under the anti-commandeering doctrine. If it's just, you know, we're going to regulate how you treat your debts, that's, that's more palatable. I think the real problem is that there may still be some constitutional constraints on direct regulation of states. Now, that was the na old National League of Cities doctrine, which was overruled. It could possibly be revived by this court. But more importantly, 
that was that doctrine was overruled in favor of a particular constitutional theory which was that you didn't need to protect the states from federal regulation of their operations because they were politically protected through their representation in congress and so the national league of cities idea may have a lot to do with how such a bankruptcy system operated even if it didn't preclude it altogether so in particular turning over the operation of the you know the, the selection of the plan to a, an agency where the states are not represented at all. There are no political safeguards of federalism whatsoever. I think that's, that's uniquely problematic. Um, it may also be um, difficult to turn it over to a bankruptcy court. Bankruptcy courts are arguably unconstitutional under Article III after Stern versus Marshall. Um, it's unclear whether the states would rather be in an Article III court or a non-Article III court. They might prefer a little more political accountability because they are represented in Congress, but not at the court. Um, and then the last problem is, it seems like the, that a bankruptcy procedure is, state, is abrogation of state sovereign immunity writ large, right? You're asking the bankruptcy court to override their immunity. Now, there is a recent Supreme Court decision that suggests that the bankruptcy power um, is like the power to enforce the Civil War amendments in that it does allow Congress to override state sovereign immunity. Um, I think that decision may have a half-life about 30 seconds with the current um, line of justices. It, it is not well-reasoned, in my opinion. Um, and I think more than that, that allowed abrogation in bankruptcy in a situation where the state was a peripheral player in the bankruptcy, not where we're forcing the state to be the debtor and allow other people to recover against it. I think that's a whole different kettle of fish. Um, and so I, I think there's, you know, it, it's interesting. I think Adam is exactly right that once you start pushing on the assumption that involuntary base bankruptcy is just a, a, a categorical um, non-starter under principles of state sovereignty, that turns out not to be true. On the other hand, I think a variety of these theories may spell trouble for that kind of, of idea. So okay. thanks very much. Great. Thank you. Um, Adam, would you like a minute or two to respond to that? Or should we, otherwise we'll throw it open to Q&A for 15 minutes. Well, uh, why don't we do... A minute or two. But I Well, I was going to say we could do Q&A, and I, and I can I maybe okay. get back if the questions don't spur it. But I, at some point, I'll, I'll, I'll make a point to respond. So, questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, fantastic presentations across the board. But a question for Professor Young about that coercion step in Um what, what is the difference? I know this is, it hasn't been fully developed, and there's this, as you said, that, um, that these kinds of conditions in this context could be the outer bound. Um, what is the difference between a coercive condition and one that is an incentive, that where there's a very clear <coughs> incentive to say yes because it's in their interest to do so in some senses, but it's going to have to be something that a state will have to weigh? In other words, when does something become go from being a carrot to a stick in this in this context? And and what what is an, what are some examples of something that is clearly coercive? What are some examples that are clearly not? And what is the gray area? And how does that put together? Have you seen The Godfather? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the offer that you can't refuse, right? So I mean, this is, this so is like brains on the <laughs> <laughs> or the horse in the bed, horse head in bed. Um, <laughs> Look, I have to say, so this, this involves the unconstitutional conditions doctrine, right? When, when do we treat, which is not to say conditions are unconstitutional, but when do you have to treat the condition on a benefit? If, you, if you're not entitled to get the benefit, but you're being asked to give up something you are constitutionally entitled not, you know, to have or not to do, when do you treat the condition on the benefit as if it were an outright mandate, right? Now, it's, it's true that you could impose any conditions that Congress would mandate directly. Um, but I think some of these conditions could not be mandated directly. And so the, the, that's, then the question is, can you get at them you know, the other way? And I have to tell you, many an academic career has just died in this swamp, right? right? I mean, people have, have, have killed forests of trees trying to, to theorize the unconstitutional <laughs> conditions doctrine about how much is too much. And, and, and I don't think anybody has, has succeeded in taming it. We only have one example um, of an unconstitutional condition in the federalism context, and that's New York versus United States, where um, Congress is acting, asking the states to regulate low-level radioactive waste um, in a particular way, which it, it can't mandate directly under the, under the common doctrine, right? 
It says, okay, you have a choice. You can either regulate in the way that we ask you to regulate, or you can simply take title to all the low-level radioactive waste. I always think of the, the glowing rod from the nuclear power plant in the Simpsons introduction, right? I mean, that's where you can just own all that stuff and be liable for all the damages that it causes if it's not properly disposed of. And the court says, um, making the state just take over ownership of and liability for all the glowing low-level radioactive waste in the state, it, that's, that's a coercive. You know, that, that's not really a choice, right? That's the only data point we yeah. have. That's, that's like the example from The Godfather where there's going to be a penalty, but what if you have something where the federal government comes and says, look, we're, we've got this pot of money and we're going to give you for, uh, as a bailout, but as a condition of that, you have to enter into these, you know, these, these steps, this involuntary bankruptcy case. Why wouldn't that be constitutional? I think the question is, it's coercive if the states don't have a meaningful choice. And especially if, this, if the federal government has a, ha a hand in creating the non-meaningfulness of the choice. So for instance, if you create a situation where the state, where the federal government takes in all the tax money and then parcels it out back out to the states that are willing to do its bidding, and all the states that refuse to take it, you know, having paid on the front end, are really disadvantaged in their com competition with other states on the back end by not taking the money, that's, that's a serious problem. I mean, that's a pretty neat trick. At, at some point, that's got to become unconstitutional, yeah, right? You know we take it all, and then you know, we'll give it all back to you as long as you do exactly what we say. That, that would be coercive. Is there a bright line in the middle? No way, right? But I, I think the fact that a very, very minor spending condition in Dole was upheld doesn't tell us that any condition is going to be okay. It's the conventional wisdom that the court will never enforce this. Um, but I don't think Dole necessarily stands for that. Okay. Sir. As Emily mentioned earlier, uh, 49 states have balanced budget amendments to their constitution. And if these were all working well, I don't think we'd have a conference here today, or at least it wouldn't be on this topic. Uh, but I don't know much of anything about variations and how these are working, and I wonder if any of you can enlighten me. I understand that one difference in uh, enforceability or workability, effectiveness of these uh, provisions is whether you have to make up for a deficit uh, or you can just start over with a clean slate and uh, so on. Uh, but uh, I wonder if the panel has uh, any insights into which of these are working well and which are working badly and whether we can use any of that experience uh, to address what is going to come up on the federal level again because it's in the budget agreement. Uh, a constitutional balance budget amendment for the nation, uh, and uh, which is something I consider a, a scary prospect, uh, not because it's not a worthy goal, but because it won't work. And it seems to me there must be some experience with these 49 state provisions that would help us understand more about conditions under which these work or don't work. I, I haven't spent a lot of time looking at the different balanced budget um, amendments. Steve, is this something that you No, I've not here? looked at it directly. Does anyone in this room, <laughs> has anyone looked at it? Well, I mean, just no, things actually. that have already come up today. I mean, one, one of the major op set of or some of the major sets of obligations that states have are things that aren't subject to these limitations. Uh, obligations to, to state employees, for example. So. To the extent that, that it doesn't cover potential uh, uh, li obligations and liabilities, then a, then a provision isn't very helpful. And the, the backside of this is that the, these crises are a function of, of very low economic growth and, and performance, so that you can have a, a level of, of indebtedness or a set of obligations that are sustainable in one context and not another. Uh, yes. Um, 
I have two questions for Adam. Uh, one is very brief, uh, and, and Ernie mentioned this, uh, whether the question of uh, whether it's an Article Three court or bankruptcy court, whether that matters to you uh, one way or the other, and whether it's sort of constitutionally anything hinges on this. That's sort of the brief version. The larger question is whether you could say a little bit about uh, the analogy or what Chapter 9 might teach us about your proposal. Because my, I know very little about it, but my impression is that Chapter 9 works tolerably well for, let's call it, fresh start bankruptcies. Okay? So the Mosquito District has an accident. Somebody slips, you know, in some field, and they have a verdict against them, and you drum the, the district through bankruptcy, and <coughs> the trial lawyer takes a haircut, and the plaintiff takes a haircut, and after, there's nothing wrong with the mosquito district per se. It you know does what it does afterwards. That it seems to me is not what you're looking for with large jurisdiction and in particular not states. Their entire business model is a mess, right? And now if you're looking for bankruptcy proceeding that actually does make a difference, then all of a sudden I'm you know in profound sympathy with Professor Young. Um, you want a bankruptcy court restructure? an entire political process of a state. And if you don't do that, right, then what have you actually gained as a result, as a practical matter, out of bankruptcy proceeding? Right? And that's I mean that's one of the attractions it seems to me of Peter's proposal, that it goes to that at least part of the problem. It it wouldn't emerge with the same dysfunctional system post hoc. Yeah, so, um, no, that's great because it gives me an opportunity to maybe uh, address some of uh, Ernie's points as well. So I, I'm not at all uh, stuck on a, a venue or a particular forum. I, I think a bankruptcy court and bankruptcy judges have unique kind of institutional ca capacity to deal with something like this. Um, but if, if objections hinged on that, then um, certainly I, I, I would imagine that the same objections wouldn't apply to a district court, although people may have legitimacy concerns about a federal court in, in general. But, um, but I'm not stuck on, on venue. Uh, on the, so the, the chapter nine and, and you know, what, what are we asking bankruptcy to do here? I, I agree, my sense is that chapter nine works pretty well. Uh, in uh, in the context that it's been employed, and that this would be a different context. Um, certainly, that you you wouldn't really be able to kind of employ the machinery in the same way, and and uh, and have a kind of a cram down on creditors, for example, necessarily in the same way. Um, but I'm I'm separating. To me, there are two different questions. One is the are we in bankruptcy, and then. What does being in bankruptcy mean in this particular context? Um, in, in other words, what happens once you're in? And I'm only really interested in whether we can force someone, a state, into that room. And then what, what happens in that room can be very open-ended. And, and frankly, I think really what, what would be beneficial and is really all we could hope for is to get the parties into that room and and create a structure in which they can conduct the type of negotiated settlement that's really all that's going to work in this context anywhere. Yeah, and in, 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 in answer, in answer to your question, uh, this is a, something I've thought about a lot. And in the current issue of the UCLA Law Review, I have an article. It's 59 UCLA 322, 59 UCLA Law Review 322. And it's called a minimalist approach to state bankruptcy with bankruptcy in quotation marks, because it focuses on what aspects of, of you know chapter nine and other lessons from from sovereign debt restructuring might be applicable in the state context. Concludes that most aspects of the chapter are not applicable; would be mess it up. But there are certain things that are critical. Uh, sir, question. Yeah. Oh. I, I was going to respond to the question about balanced budgets um, earlier because while I'm no expert on this, I can tell you that the North Carolina balanced budget provision um, re only requires the appropriation bill to approximate estimated revenue. 
And as the revenue comes in over the course of the biennium, the two-year budget period, you're matching appropriations with revenue. And then there's the extraordinary provision which allows the governor to, quote, make necessary economies, subject always to paying the creditors, the bondholders. Um, and I find that extraordinary because it gives the governor, and it directs the governor to make appropriations decisions, normally made, of course, by the General Assembly. There's been recent litigation about that. And as a matter of fact, a very colorful case in which the um, plaintiff lawyer brought in two buckets full of cash and talked about the governor taking money out of one bucket and putting it in the other bucket. And this was what he claimed she was doing. And the North Carolina Supreme Court could not resolve the question. There was a, a lower court decision, appellate court decision, saying that her decision had been constitutional. When it reached the North Carolina Supreme Court, one justice recused, the other six split 3-3. Three, three. They had no decision, which means the lower court ruling stands. But in North Carolina jurisprudence, to my bafflement, the Supreme Court maintains that the lower court decision has no precedential value. I don't know how that's possible. But that's what they say, and, and they, apparently they mean that. And so in each state, you're going to have this problem of matching estimated revenue with appropriation, and who is going to sort it out in the end. I have no idea how it works elsewhere. Here, it is managed to keep things more or less in line, leaving to one side always these revenue increment bonds and a lot of other off-budget kind of borrowing which has gone on. But that's a short answer to that question. Can I make one quick comment? Yes. Um, just, just responding to Ernie. Um, I thought it was interesting that you described Hans as posing an existential threat to well, the state. Well, the debts that Hans involved. See, I thought it posed an existential step threat to the court. Because I think if the court had ordered Louisiana to pay, it would have done just what its attorney general said it was going to do. Mm -hmm. Not change its behavior at all. Not yeah. pay. State of Louisiana would be safe, go on. The court would be left with egg on its face that it's made an unenforceable yeah. order. I, I completely agree with that. Um, I'm just wondering, you know more, a lot more about these debts than I do. I mean, could they have been paid? I mean, I mean I, my impression was the Revolutionary War debts really couldn't have been yeah. at, the, at the time by the states, but, but what about the Reconstruction? I mean, were, the, were there sufficient assets in the state of Louisiana, which, if levied upon by the tax collector, could have paid the debts? I, I think so. I mean, but aside from that somewhat facetious response, um, I don't think they were unmanageable. Okay. Um, they, they were politically mm -hmm. objectionable because they had been adopted during the Reconstruction era and were now being the, the post-Reconstruction government was the now new redemptionist government was supposed to pay them off, um, and they were just going to refuse. So I think I thought the problem was more political than economic, okay. um, and I think defiance would have have worked, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. I thought the court was trying to escape from that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's a brief little comment. Time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, yes. So this is just to the panel generally. What is state bankruptcy for? Um, in the sense that, so we understand for private institutions, so the reason that you go bankrupt is both to assure the creditors of a sort of fair allocation um, for the money that you do have, and if you're trying to reorganize, to allow you to discharge liabilities that you otherwise would have had. But if states really can get away with not paying um, you know, they, they can get away with a default, um, and they have in the past. You know, why, so what do we need state bankruptcy for? Is it just to make sure the creditors get treated fairly? And if that's the answer, why not just say, you know, look, creditors, you were dumb enough to lend to a state? <laughs> well, I, I, I tend to agree with you in that I have another piece, a chapter in Peter's book, actually, that, that argues essentially that, I mean, the but there are, I mean, you can sense from discussion, there are strategies that, that parties will you know, try to employ to complicate a state's effort to just walk away from, from obligations uh, and, and political costs. And federal, federal law plays, would, would facilitate um, a, a restructuring if it were available, especially to get around the contracts clause. 
um, and, and some other legal strategies. Yeah, and I, I would see, I mean, there are various advantages, um, but I would see one of the major uh, reasons for justifications uh, for a state that wishes to restructure its debt, and there could be reputational cost reasons relating to that, it does enable the state to negotiate in good faith while solving a collective action problem with holdout creditors. I think it's one of the main purposes. Well, we're out of time. I want to thank this distinguished, wonderful panel. Briefly, I would just like to thank again all of our participants and moderators and um, uh, particularly our keynote, Professor Orth, uh, for, for being here today. I know I have learned an enormous amount uh, and I hope that you all have enjoyed yourselves. Um, for those of you who are interested, the uh, articles that were the subject of the symposium will be published in our spring issue. Um, and more information about that can be found on our website, uh, djclpp.law.duke.edu. So thank you again for being here, and um, another round of applause for our participants. Thank you. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.